and three. All right. Bismillah. Uh, we're here with Matt again. Haven't done a podcast for a while. This is, seems to be the podcast season again. Uh, everybody wants to talk uh, to, to me and about a whole bunch of stuff. We want to cover um, a couple of ground if we get the time tonight. But one thing I wanted to discuss in this particular podcast is um, something that I've been thinking about for quite a long time, and I've actually discussed it with other people, but never in an actual podcast. And that is the role of the Baha'i organization during the 1960s and early 1970s as a uh, counter pro tool of the American establishment uh, to neutralize uh, the civil rights movement. Now we're not saying that it, it you know, the, the Baha'is had the, the lion's share of this because there were many different organizations that were involved, but it has always been very um, suspicious to me that you had several key members of the civil rights movement of the 1960s, not, you know, significant leaders of, of the stature of Martin Luther King, et cetera, but people who were involved on, on the, uh, in the management and, and the activist level of this thing who, were, who converted to Baha'ism. And then soon thereafter, um, basically fell out of the struggle as it were, or were, uh, you know, became basically then fell in line with the policies of the Baha'i organization. And this, you know, is an, I think is a very murky area of history that, that um, still needs to be written. There was a gentleman in Albuquerque, New Mexico. I won't name him. Uh, I don't know whether he's still alive or, or, or dead. He was an African-American gentleman. Uh, but he said something to this effect to me. He had been kind of become very disenchanted with the Baha'i organization. He had joined the Baha'i faith in the late 1960s, in 1968 or 9, I believe, from my memory. And he actually dropped this bombshell originally that a lot of the people, whether in the cities or, and especially in, in the South of the United States, uh, who were mass converted to this organization, um, were then very promptly, as a result of pressure brought on them by uh, Will Met uh, and his agents, uh, they were kind of neutralized out of the civil, civil rights struggle in the United States. And especially at a very sensitive period, and this is the period immediately after the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Um, now, you know, you have some of these ex-Baha'is in this like Reddit subreddits, whatnot, and whenever these sorts of issues are brought up, um, that the Baha'i organization is serving uh, a significant element of the establishment, they wax incredulous. And even though these people are claiming to be ex-Baha'is and they rant and rave about how bad the Baha'i faith is, when it comes to this particular issue, all of these people, you know, um, uh, act in such a way that makes one believe that, the, that we're dealing um, either with extremely stupid people or um, basically these people are paid trolls because they're all operating under aliases anyway. They're, it's not their real names. You don't know who these people are. Um, precisely put on these various lists to detract the possibility of the discussion of the fact that the Baha'i organization, the hyphen Baha'i organization, and particularly in the United States, is a very significant player within the greater American establishment. Um, I have been saying these things for years. The evidence is overwhelming. It's not just you know a trickle of evidence. It's a massive amount of evidence. And now it's you know a lot of the stuff is out in the open. Um, so you know all you have to do is do your research online, and all of this stuff comes up, you know, promptly. I mean, Kevin and Yahya and I even found names uh, not too long ago uh, within this published list of the, of, uh, the list of uh, Jeffrey Epstein. And these are Iranian Baha'is living in the, in the tri-state area. Uh, and they were on Jeffrey Epstein's list. Now, nothing further has come of it. And we haven't really pursued this because there's been other things going on. Uh, but yet, you know, we should telegraph the fact that we know uh, that individual Baha'is have actually come up in this Jeffrey Epstein list. Not overwhelming numbers of names, but uh, one or two names have actually come up, and they're Persian. Um, so those who are incredulous amongst the ex-Baha'i crowd, and these are basically people usually associated with that 
extremely you know dubious um, ex Baha'i Reddit subreddit. Um, those people, in my opinion, are um, not only a, it's not only a waste of time spending any time with these people, uh, but anybody who has genuinely stumbled on this information, whether online or in, through their uh, you know through their life interactions or what have you, and have seen things that have made them go ah. Um, you're not alone, uh, and there is an overwhelming amount of evidence for this. You know, there is, I've mapped out a significant Baha'i presence in uh, the world of international finance and banking, whether we're talking from the UK, within the United States, you know, significant people who are top, you know, have top managerial positions, in, you know, in, in institutions like Goldman Sachs. One of them was my sister. Um, who I haven't spoken to in many years. So it's not as if I don't have any insider information. I have quite a lot of insider information. And there have been others uh, besides that. Then we have the fact that the entire human rights regime between the Atlantic and between the Pacific Oceans is constantly dominated by agendas that the Baha'is are trying to push. These human rights organizations are intrinsically linked to the policy agendas of governments like the, that of the United States. Amnesty International in particular, Human Rights Watch is another one. Um, and the Baha'is are constantly, they're pushing that agenda. Uh, the Baha'is are in the world of the Anglophone media. The entire Persian section of the Independent, we're now found, finding out that its top editorial team are Baha'is. The BBC Persian, it has been an open secret for years that it is completely dominated by, by Baha'is, its hosts, uh, especially someone like Daryush Karimi is a, comes from a very prominent Baha'i family. Um, same goes for, you know, Voice of America. You've had Baha'is there uh, steering the policy there in the Persian section. And on and on and on this evidence goes. Even within the, you know, within the, the transatlantic, uh, you know, military establishment, whether we're talking on the level of government or we're talking on the level of the, of the corporate arms industry. There are Baha'is, you know, dotting every element of this. So the evidence has been put up there. We put a lot of, of this evidence up back during the, the noughties uh, on that site, the SourceWatch. Once SourceWatch was uh, bought out by from its original owners, some of this evidence went offline. We, we still have that evidence because we wrote much of this stuff. And it was our research. Um, so the evidence exists. And... You know, this stuff can very easily be put in front of a court of law uh, if, if the situation ever demands uh, to prove that the sorts of accusations that are usually that, you know, white supremacists and conspiracy theorists usually level at the Jews um, is actually a reality where the Baha'i organization is concerned. And what has to wonder, you know, the why is, I think, at this point is kind of irrelevant. Uh, the, the, it's not even the why anymore. It's the fact that we are living in a situation that these people have moved up into higher echelons of, uh, of institutions of power throughout the West. Uh, the fact that almost every parliament uh, in the Atlanticist block every year on the dot is sending greetings and, and congratulations for Baha'i holidays and particularly Noru's um, is quite telling. Why do they care? And especially if the claim is that Baha'is have insignificant numbers, an organization with insignificant numbers doesn't elicit the kind of response uh, from parliaments and governments that these people do. So this proves that the issue of numbers itself is an insignificant um, point. Uh, they're enough, they wield enough of influence uh, whereby governments and parliaments especially see necessity uh, to keep these people on, 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 you know, keep them on their good side. Um, so, you know, these retorts by some of these extremely ignorant individuals in, in, on Reddit uh, can very easily be countered. But the point that I think is especially important in this discussion is about that era of the 1960s or early 1970s when you had this massive teaching campaign, whether in the southern United States or in, in the cities, etc., where all these African-Americans that became Baha'is, many of them came out of the civil rights struggle. Once they, they signed that card, and especially they got active in their communities, 
this was essentially a neutralizing operation. So, you know, if people ask the question, I'm, I'm, we're not saying that the Baha'is were the only one and that, you know, that, that we don't want to give them that credit, but the establishment, except, especially at the tail end of the years of J. Edgar Hoover, while well, he was, you know, he, he retired, uh, he was retired out of his position, I think somewhere around 1966 or 1967. But as we're moving to the period of his retirement, that institution put its foot to the pedal to basically unravel as much of this stuff as it possibly could. So that once we move into the immediate post J. Edgar Hoover period, uh, and this is the period where you have the efflorescence of, of the Black Panther Party, et cetera, the, the policies uh, and the mechanisms were already in place to unravel a lot of this. And we saw the, the, the fist by which the establishment in the United States um, put the boot in to the Black Panthers, to the American Indian movement, uh, the manner in which, for example, Wounded Knee unfolded, the questions that still linger over what actually happened in Wounded Knee, uh, the infiltrators that went there, the woman that was murdered, whether that was done by, by insiders or by, by agent provocateurs, all of these questions are still there. But we know that that era, and in particular during the early years of the presidency of Richard Nixon, um, that the establishment went all out to, to, to pull the, the, the rug from under the feet of these movements, whether it's civil rights, Native American rights, Latino rights, a lot of the flower power stuff, the moratorium, anti-war movement, etc. cetera. Um, and the Baha'is on that, on the ground level within the United States played a very major role in all of this, despite what you know the, the, the naysayers are saying. Um, at least I have the testimony of one very significant individual who was living in, in New Mexico, uh, who basically with me in conversation went on record saying that, that this is what they believed, that this is what had happened, and that they regret uh, having ever gotten involved with this thing uh, because they only realized too late uh, that this was a scam, essentially. Yeah, no, I didn't, I got a lot to say on that. Um, first, um, I'm reminded, and again, I'll not name names. This was someone who was Baha'i. Um, he died about nine years ago, and he was, he was a good guy um, of African descent. And you know, I, I certainly wasn't as conscious then as I am now, but you know, he was, you might say, still, he was still fighting against racism within the faith. Yeah. Okay. And, you know, so to me, even though you might, you know, a part of him was still in the struggle, you might say, because he had to fight it within the faith, he was essentially neutralized. He was, he was actually a former Black Panther. And um, by having to fight it within, it's just putting up one more layer that is, an eff that is effectively neutralizing people, even those do want to continue in the struggle after joining the faith and thinking they're somehow still in it, because it's just one more layer that wouldn't need to be there. And they could be out in the community more dealing with these issues. Um, certainly nowadays on social media, because there are a lot of lay Baha'is who want, you know, who you know, are, you know, part of things like, I don't want to necessarily say Black Lives Matter because I just, although I agree with the slogan, it doesn't go far enough. It's become, the, the organization has become a Democratic Party sheepdog and um, you know, it doesn't get to real, you know, saying Black Lives Matter is still a plea. It's still putting the focus on what goes on in Whitey's head. Yeah. Rather than actively work for Black power so that what goes on in Whitey's head don't matter. Mm. And, but I know Baha'is who are involved in, you know, who are involved, who are involved in the Black struggle. Um, as well as you know, as well as many other struggles, and they are often um, other Baha'is will try to neutralize them, just the way um, 
Persians can be particularly, um, just the way a lot of Asians are called in to, yeah. you know, be the way the Irish originally were called in to be the initial foot soldiers of white. Yeah. Uh, okay. A, um, a lot of them are often called in to just preach like the colorblind line. And it's the, it's the same thing with the Anglo-Saxon um, expa high crowd as well. It's, you know, same difference where those lay Baha'is who do want to be involved in these struggles have an extra, it's, it's just like one more barrier in front of them having to fight it within the Baha'i faith as well as outside. And uh, so, so it's really just, it's taking them out of the greater community and this, the greater I, struggle in a lot of ways. You know, I've, I've, I've asked this question of, of several different African-American Baha'is while I was in the United States back in the 90s. Um, given the fact that, that a lot of these people came out of the civil rights struggle and you look around that community and I mean, this is the 90s. I mean, we've worked now 30 years since that time. You look around and you, you know, you ask these people, well, you, you notice that we got, there's problems here, you know, that, that this issue of racism ex it very much exists within this community. I mean, despite all the sloganeering and, and preaching and all the things that, that you claim as an organization to believe in, yet within your own community, there are, you know, there's an apartheid between white and black. There are apartheid between different ethnicities of Iranians. Uh, there's an apartheid of wealth. You know, so the classism is there. Um, how do you, in your own mind, look at this organization, given the fact that you came into this organization with all this hope, right? That, that you know, this was now a movement that where you could actually then channel all your energies that you had put into the civil rights movement into something like this, but then you find yourself basically trapped. And this is a very ingenious ploy that the establishment of the United States used because by, by using the Baha'is to absorb these people into its organization, right? They neutered the movement. Yep. And, and meanwhile, as they did that, you know, even though the intentions of the NAACP and organizations like the United States was great, uh, the fact of the matter is that since the, the, since the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King and then, um, you know, uh, that summer of violence in 68 and onwards, the NAACP itself became an absorbed entity within the greater American establishment. Yep. And, you know, in the, the, the pace of, of change um, back in, during that decade of the 1960s that was um, realized, if this train, in my opinion, had not stopped, uh, America would have been a completely different society right now. So there was an intention by a, a very powerful element of within the establishment way beyond the presidency, because Lyndon Johnson, to his credit, as much as a corrupt individual this guy was, and he was, and probably even the man responsible behind the assassination of John F. Kennedy, the fact is that um, LBJ, on the issue of civil rights and, and racism, was had his heart in the right place, even if it was from a point of view of prudence uh, and, and a strategic application, the way he, he pushed both the Dixiocrats and the Republican Party within the U.S. Congress in '64 uh, to get the Civil Rights Bill through the Senate was ingenious. I mean, Kennedy would have never been able to do this to, to pull this off, especially in the election year, but LBJ did it. Uh, so you know, we give the man credit where credit is due, but LBJ didn't get, didn't want to run a second term, and in that election year that uh, you know, decided the fate of, of, of at least the civil rights movement in the United States, you had basically Richard Nixon getting elected president, which meant that a Humphrey president who, who was uh, uh, Johnson's vice president at the time, uh, means that basically the whole civil rights movement from that point onwards were put, was put on notice by the establishment, particularly after the November election of 68 you know, about five months since the assassination of, of Martin Luther King. And quickly, very, very, you know, swiftly after the inauguration of Nixon, 
we see that the establishment in America puts his foot to the pedal like nothing else. They go after the Black Panthers. Uh, they start rounding up these various uh, radical student movements like SDS. Uh, you know, uh, there's questions about the Symbionese Liberation Army, whether they were actually a counter operation themselves or not. And on and on these examples go. But at that point in 69 and onwards, as we moved into 1970 and then into 1971, 72, 73, we see that the manner in which these movements are crushed, literally crushed, um, is something to behold. And this is the, the concern, and this is what this gentleman back in Albuquerque, back in the 90s was, was kind of confessing, his mea culpa, is that you know the arrival of the Baha'is on the scene and the recruitment of a lot of African-Americans throughout the South, the US South, and then also in the cities, Chicago, LA, New York, et cetera, was actually part of uh, the initiative of the American establishment to neutralize the civil rights movement. Because the leadership that you see in the next generation, whether we're talking about Jesse Jackson uh, or you know, even Al Sharpton for that matter, you know, people who came out of that immediate period after the assassination. The ones who Malcolm X warned about. <laughs> yeah, the kind of people that Malcolm X specifically warned about, these people themselves were compromised. Now I'm not saying that they were or originally corrupt, but in the absence of a charismatic figure, right, who, who broke no compromises, such as Martin Luther King, right, whatever his personal, you know, failings may have been, but as a leader of a civil rights movement, the man was, was like nothing else. But in the absence of a figure such as him, um, the movement felt lost, and because no one could fill the, those, that, you know, that, that shadow properly, um, the establishment took full advantage of this and moved quickly, using every means at its, at its disposal, but the Baha'is being one of those means, to absorb individuals into the Baha'i organization and thereby neutralize them. Yeah, I'll also just put up the stat that the one state um, with the most Baha'is in it, or at least, at least per capita, maybe not overall, when compared to a place like, say, California, but the one state with the highest Baha'i population per capita by far, it's the only state where the Baha'is are the second highest religion behind Christianity, although that may include a lot of these mascot people who are not active Probably. and haven't been. Probably. Um, is South Carolina. Well, I mean, I've, I've, and, ta I've talked to people who were actually involved in these teaching campaigns, and I got them to describe for me in as much explicit detail as they could exactly what happened. You know, when these people, you know, when they were recruiting people, what exactly did these people understand about what they were getting into? And this is what the yeah. description was. The description was, the National Spiritual Assembly of the United States at the time basically handed these people um, a, a pamphlet asking people, do you believe in A, B, C, E, F, G, right? Um, door to door. And if they said to yes to at least five or six of them or all of them, and these people agreed to sign, right? Basically, they would hand, hand them a card. These people had no idea what they were getting into. They were saying, do you believe in racism? Do you believe in God is one? Do you believe blood? this? Do you believe just the most general elements of these so-called 12 principles, right? Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, I mean, they would basically ambush individuals. Do you believe in X, Y, Z? Yeah, I believe X, Y, Y, Z. Oh, then you're behind. Here, sign the car. Are you about, you believe this? Yeah. Well, then you're behind. <laughs> sign the car. And this was the strategy. So the numbers that, um, they picked up in the South during that period was all as a result of this. And it is very possible that a lot of, a lot of the inflated numbers that they have in the, in the U.S. South that they are still holding on the books are from that era, these very bogus recruitment efforts. Yeah, well, I think the point that I'm making here is that despite that high number where you have an allegedly significant Baha'i population, have you, has that transformed the state of South Carolina any beyond any others? Nope. No, it hasn't done, it hasn't done a thing. Um, it's still one of the poorest states you know, in the nation. Not the poorest, but um, 
yeah, I mean, you know, it's, it's a struggling state overall. Um, always has been. So, you know, I mean, if you want to look at, the, you know, if you compare, you know, what the Baha'is are doing in their communities to say, well, okay, what the, what, what the Black Panthers did, okay, they're doing absolutely nothing. And that's, you know, now what's very insidious is that because the Baha'is are a religion, claim to be anyway. Now, there is there it will they will use divinity as a justification for why they're still around. You know, when in fact it's because they're cozied up to the establishment and divinity has nothing to do with it. I no joke at one little Baha'i gathering, this is probably a good somewhere in the 15 to 20 year ago range actually um had someone say that the reason why india is such a mess is because you know good-hearted as gandhi was you know he wasn't more or less wasn't right with god <laughs> um now i can say a lot of criticism about gandhi but the fact that he reduced the whole Indian liberation movement uh, to, oh, well, they really didn't have, you know, they, they really weren't, you know, religious and godly. I mean, you know, and completely discrediting um, not only all the other people besides Ghani, like Bhagat Singh, but not seeing the role of British colonialism, continued corruption by British and American intelligence, um, it very much becomes a, you know, a, I hate to use the word veil because they use it so much, but uh, the religiosity just becomes a justification for for their basic apathy and inaction on any real social issue despite claiming to be for them. Mm. And that's, this is why I would submit why the US establishment or general Anglo-American establishment finds this organization so extremely useful because yep. uh, through this double speak, right? And I mean, now nobody's buying their spiel anymore, but back then, uh, I mean, it's, it was very attractive, but th at that point, you know, I mean, when, when, you know, if you're somebody at the top of the, 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 the food chain in the American establishment of the 1960s and 1970, say you're J. Edgar Hoover or his successor, and you're looking at this organization, it says, damn, you know, we can use these people, you know, and particularly given the fact that one of the principles of the Baha'is is, is obedience to government. Right. So, you know, that, yeah. the, that the kind of problems that you will get from, you know, social rights and civil rights kind of movements is not going to come from these people precisely because of this principle. So let them espouse racial equality, you know, this, that and the other thing. Right. Um, we will use this organization to absorb these people. Right. Who are a source of irritation to us into their own organization. Right. And that way. That, organ, that, that entire movement just basically goes to the wayside. And what's left of it um, is made toothless enough that we can then absorb that movement into our own establishment and control it perpetually, which is what happened in, in the United States. Because, and particularly in the period just after when uh, the members of the Black Panthers are, are arrested and, and you know people like Kwame Thuri leave America um, and Angela Davis and all of these guys are gone or arrested or whatnot. Um, through from, I would say, immediately after the period after Wounded Knee, that entire generation who had stood at the, at the proverbial barricades, whether of the civil rights movement, the, the, the student movement, the anti-war movement, flower power, the whole kit and caboodle, um, all of a sudden they either, most of these people start moving into the middle class, right? Um, or they just go, they fall completely silent from that period onwards. And 
for longest time, I didn't understand, you know, what, what, what happened? You know, all of these hippies, all of these activists, it was only a, you know, a, a few number of years separating, you know, their activism from their non-activism. So what happened? And the more, one, by faith. yeah, and the more one digs, the more one sees that situations such as this organization, such as the Baha'is, were employed by the American establishment of that period precisely to neutralize everything, you know. Yeah, and then you also have so much, I mean, so much of the dogma, I know they hate that term, but sorry, it is. So much of the dogma in the faith then only serves to further neutralize. All of Abbas's um, anti-anger, new agey horseshit. Okay, he's big on that. You know, that, that needs to be countered with, I think it was James Baldwin who said, if, you know, if you're a black man in America and even a little bit awake, you're in an almost constant state of anger. And, you know, to, to compare that with, you know, oh, oh, we need to, you need to not be angry. And then even that people go to the point, I even was had to memorize this in Sunday school and it's, well, I can remember most of it, but it's just absolutely disgusting. Abdul Baha's prayer for America, saying, render this just government victorious. And I'm sorry, fuck that. Fuck America. The, the, the just government you know, that, that that bombed, the, you know, napalmed and bombed and yeah. ag Agent Orange, most of Indochina. The just government yeah, that is responsible yeah. for the genocide of, of an estimated 200 million plus Native Americans. Uh, the just government that is uh, responsible for internment of Japanese the Americans war. during the Second for, World War. The just government. Not to mention slavery, Jim slavery, Crow, the prison the, industrial complex. And on and on and on and go. See, this is the thing. This yeah. is the thing. And I've addressed this in several different places, most notably recently in, in uh, the 12th unity of the Persian Bayan. Close, bro. Yeah. Yeah, I'm here. Um, okay, go. I've I addressed this is that this Apos Effendi, despite the fact that they have turned this guy into a, a idol, right, is yeah. the quintessential mouthpiece of a corrupt establishment. And the fact is that the guy even wanted to be that, that very thing. Yeah. Hence the prayer for America, a leader of a religious movement, right, um, either stays out of the fray of these sorts of political games, right? As they claim, yep. as they claim that they that they are, or uh, doesn't you know, or is more honest about you know what it is that they're actually doing. And Abdul Baha was not that at all. He was an extremely distinct yeah. player. So yeah, I mean, he, he was the opposite of liberation theology. He was not only the um, opposite of, of of liberation theology. The man was the quintessence of of, of a calculated reactionary. You know, he, yes, this is what he epit epitomized that, and you see this. In his letters, in his, his, you know, that prayer for America, uh, the discourses that were recorded in, in, in North America where he calls, you know, the African savages, um, and he tells the Native Americans that they, sh they should thank Columbus for discovering the <laughs> continent, you know, I mean, just, you know, endorsing yeah. the doctrine of discovery. Uh, and, and see, you know, back then, I wasn't completely back in the 90s, I didn't have all these elements together. But if I did, I would have asked this gentleman, in Albuquerque. Well, um, if you know about these things, then Abdul Baha said these sorts of things, you know, and you're dis disenchanted, disappointed out of this whole so called movement. Why you continue having your name on the walls of this thing? Any, yeah. any other person of conscience would have said, fuck this, and walked out, voted with their feet. See you later. Yeah. So this is the question I've asked for a long time because you know, fortunately I didn't suffer from this kind of cognitive dissonance because once I realized what this thing was, you know, I basically you know, uh, took a sledgehammer to the Talgut, as it were, <laughs> and, um, and haven't looked back. But the fact of the matter is, it doesn't make any sense to me as to the kind of hold this organization seems to have upon adherents who even know that this organization is corrupt to its foundation and that the mythos that they have been churning out about these, you know, these exalted so-called figures of theirs like Abbas Effendi is all a myth. 
yet they don't leave. Yeah. They don't now, with their Persian Iranian Baha'is, it's understandable because many of these people have their families and, and you know, all of that, right? So it's a family thing. And with, with Persians, uh, you know, the, the, because as much as some of even these modernized per Persians pretend that they're modernized, um, the thinking is still in many ways tribal, right? So it's very yeah. difficult for these people to cut their losses or cut their, you know, cut themselves off from this organization and the realization of what it is that they're dealing with. Um, but yet this fact remains. And I've also asked this of many of these so-called scholars who have dealt with the texts of the Bab and who have dealt, you know, who've read Sofa Azam, who know the history, who know that the weight of the historical evidence actually weighs in favor of the Bayani narrative about what actually happened and that the Baha'ism has absolutely no legitimacy whatsoever. They know all of this. Yet they persist. They continue with the charade. And, you know, from the definition of the Quran, from the definition of, of you know, from the definition of the Quran, these people are the quintessential definition of what a kafir is. Someone who brushes over the truth, who covers the truth, even knowing what the truth is, but but decides, make that makes that conscious decision to cover over the truth because their self-interest, right, lies in perpetuating the untruth, right? And these people, in yeah. my opinion, in the eyes of the Almighty, um, have a lot of, you know, <laughs> they have a lot of explaining to do when they get to the <laughs> other side. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it'll be different for some of them. I mean, so it's like, you know, I, I mean, there are a few who I think are, you know, I'm still friends with, I think are decent people. And I think the question more from God is, man, what the fuck were you thinking? <laughs> you know? Um, it's like, you, 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 know, bartered, you, bartered, you bartered away your, your immortal soul for a temporary <laughs> security and of self-interest in that, in this fleeting life. Why are you doing this? Yeah. Yeah. Are you that stupid? Um, if you're that stupid, well, then, you know. <laughs> See that line over there with the fire coming out of the sides? <laughs> Go over there. <laughs> um, but, you know, when you get out of it, because there's so much, there's so much internal bullshit. So when you finally leave, it's like, I don't have to deal with this shit anymore. Um, you know, I mean, it's, it's liberating. Um, but, you know, I mean, when we look at, you know, cause there's, you can't just look at the laws, although you do, but you gotta think not about the letter, but how they play out. Okay, and there is so much that when you break it down of the various ordinances, or at least the particular ordinances they like to enforce, um, so that's always kind of key is which ones they enforce and don't, but you know, are so geared towards the establishment, geared towards quelling any kind of real justice. Mm. Um, because that's not the point, you know, despite the exactly, rhetoric, exactly. because despite the rhetoric and the claims and, and, you know, the principles they claim to espouse, um, that is never the point. That is just the window. That's the or, or ornamentation, the window dressing, right? Yeah. That's, that's to draw people in. Uh, once they're in, right, the mechanism of this organization is then to keep them in no matter what. So they, you know, whether they get people entangled through marriage and family or work or money, investment, you know, th th there's a limitless array of, of ways that you can- or Even just ego and having, you know, a circle ego, of friends. Yeah. Like or the, yeah. you know, the basic human fear of being alone, right? Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. they, these sorts of things, right? They, 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 hook, they hook people in. I mean, I had this conversation with my father, my late father, God rest his soul, many, many, many times. And he agreed with me and, he, you know, everything I put before him because I, you know, I pulled both of my parents out of this organization. And I said, you know, well, you know, why didn't this happen earlier? Um, and we would discuss this stuff and we would analyze and dissect the situation. 
<clears throat> you know, even if he disagreed with certain things, certain of my approaches at the beginning, at the end of the conversation, he would see it. And, you know, um, then he would admit that, yeah, you know, there, there's an issue here. Um, and it's not easily explainable. And there's a, psych there's a deep psychological thing going on here. It's almost like a, a, a very concerted form of psycholog psychological manipulation by this organization through individuals, you know, um, that keeps people in, you know, even with those people who realize what it is that they're dealing with. That you're dealing with basically a farce, Wizard of Oz. Um, yeah. But with the civil rights movement, this is a very significant angle of American history. And it's a sing significant angle of American history because the effects of what happened at the tail end of the 60s and, and throughout the 1970s, the repercussions are being only felt now. Um, and particularly in the polarization that occurred during the last decade um, that still saw the election of Trump and then, you know, the, the Black Lives Matter, the escalation in police violence, murder of, 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 of black, uh, you know, more and more murder of black people by police, police brutality, et cetera, on and on it goes. Um, now, the, the issue that I'm beginning to understand is that th these sorts of conditionings and these sorts of psychological manipulation games are ones that establishments regularly utilize in a variety of contexts, and not just in the United States, everywhere, throughout Europe, uh, here in Australia, in, in definitely in an in authoritarian state like Russia or the People's Republic of China, all of this is on steroids, um, Iran, etc. But um, the Baha'is are not a government, you understand? There's a difference between using techniques of manipulation and psychological uh, coercion and blackmail by entities um, or forces that are connected to governments. And it's another thing when, when so-called religious organizations like this one employ it. And the question I've asked is that, you know, well, you know, people are well aware of the fact that this organization is not a government, um, that it is not a law enforcement agency, that it has, um, that its entire subsistence, the entire existence is predicated by a consensus reality that is extremely flimsy. And that this flimsy consensus reality can be broken and the bubble can pop at any moment. And one of the realizations I had many years ago, 20 years ago, is that the fundamental paranoia and fear that the Baha'i organization has uh, is precisely because they understand this dynamic. That this consensus reality that they have fabricated and they are keeping th through thick and thin um, is extremely flimsy and it can pop at any time as it nearly did in the 90s with these lists, you know, and the talisman list, et cetera. Um, and because there's a large amount of money and investment and property and all this sort of thing involved, they're acting like a government or a, or a corporation in, in the way that then they go after their political enemies, try to uh, silence people within the organization itself, uh, and on and on and on it goes. Unless, you know, they find a way to, you know, draw and absorb people uh, and make them complicit in in the charade that they're running. Are you there, Matt? Yeah, I'm here. Um, you though you broke up, although I think it was just more of a. I think it so much wasn't a breakup as it was a slowdown. Yeah, that, uh, um, there's a there's a signal here saying that your network bandwidth is quite low. Um, look. Um, Let's leave this here for the time being because I think we're going to lose you um, because of yeah. the, because of the network bandwidth issue. Um, and we will we can pick this up again at a later time if you like. So, yeah, and we can at least wrap it up in a way that doesn't look like we end, ended yeah. it. Yeah, we, you know we can we can splice stuff together. Yeah, or something like that. Yeah. Okay, no but I mean we got I think because I think we got about forty five minutes of decent stuff, but it doesn't really end at much of a conclusion, but. Well, let me, let me, let me throw this conclusion since it is still recording. Um, the conclusion is the following, is that despite claims by certain people online who are incredulous about the fact that the Baha'is are a major component of the establishment within, within the Anglo-American world, um, there are certain incidents and placements, not just incidents, but the placement of certain individuals within certain key organizations and institutions that can very 
immediately disabuse anyone of the notion that these people are not major players within that establishment. Yeah. Um, and so we should probably leave it here for the time being because the, the, your bandwidth is breaking up and then pick this up again at a later time. So with that, la hoja ila ali yan qabla nabi.